I'd like to first of all um, introduce my guests here. We're talking about um, we're talking about the increase in home demolitions in Area C of the West Bank, and um, this this is what my panelists will be discussing. Um, Amira Haas is a journalist with the Israeli newspaper Haaretz. Um, she's the only Israeli journalist who lives full time in Ramallah. Israeli Jew. Israeli Jew. So there are many Israeli journalists. Yes, that's or Palestinians. True. That's and right. She's the only Israeli Jewish journalist who lives in Ramallah full time. Um, she's widely considered an expert on. Um, on issues in the, on human rights issues in the occupied territories. This is Karim Jubran. Um, he works with the, he works with the Israeli NGO that's called Betzelem. Um, he's the he's the director of their field workers, um, and he's the one who's responsible for his field workers document the process of the of the home demolitions, and he'll be talking about that as well. Um, I'm going to start with you, Amira. Um, I just wanted to, for the audience, not everyone is familiar with all of the details. Can you explain what Area C is, who lives there, and where it is? Um, Area C uh, comprises around 61% of the West Bank, the Palestinian West Bank. Uh, this is an artificial division of the West Bank. It, is not, uh, it has nothing to do with geography or the needs of the people, or the needs of the original population. Uh, it was constructed during the Oslo talks, and it was uh, an attempt to, to uh, designate a gradual Israeli military redeployment from the West Bank. Uh, redeployment, not withdrawal. So at first, the Israeli army uh, redeployed and left its forces out from the cities, which were named area, which were defined as Area A, where Palestinian Authority has full civilian control and has policing authorities. Not security authorities, but policing right. authorities. Its policemen can go uh, armed. Uh, this is area A. Area B is where Palestinians hold civilian authorities, which as in area A, where they can issue, uh, uh, where, where they can have planning, where can, they can issue construction permits, etc. Uh, but they don't have policing authorities. Any police there, Palestinian police, needs Israel coordination with the Israeli uh, military authorities. And Area C is where Israel retains its authorities, both civilian and uh, security and military, and, and policing mm -hmm. uh, authorities. The, the idea was that in, within five years after the signing of this agreement in 94, so by, 90, by 98, 99, this should have been, actually this uh, division, artificial division, should have been uh, actually obliterated. And that the, great ma that the great majority of area of the West Bank would have passed to the full authority of Palestinians in terms, at least in terms of civilian authority. That is where you can develop, issue permits, issue a... Uh, 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 change the designation of areas, etc. So, but what happened is that, as very often, that the temporary became permanent. And since the last uh, redeployment in, nine, in 89 or in 99 or at the beginning of two, yeah, 99, I think it was, it remained that 61% of the West Bank are under full Israeli civilian control. Anyway, everything is under Israeli military control. But the civilian control is what we are talking about today because this is uh, concerning issuing, planning, having master plans, allowing people to build, allowing people to develop, to invest, uh, to have economical projects. This is where everything is still in the hands of Israel. Now, 60% were, uh, which is mostly vacant, I mean, the majority of West Bank uh, empty land or not not yet uh, not yet uh, uh, yeah. inhabited yeah. is there so how many there was about 2.5 million palestinians living in the west bank right including jerusalem including yes jerusalem. Yeah. and yeah. what how many live in area so c? in area c the the there have been some some uh, difficulties in assessing because the census did not include area c the palestinian census did not include area c as such but uh, a recent un study Soros study found out that there are around 300,000 people living there, though 90,000 live in um, communities which are 100% in Area C. Mm -hmm. The rest live in area in, in neighborhoods which are adjacent to the same mm -hmm. 
localities or communities, but who have, are in area A and B. Mm -mm. Because again, as I want to say, area C is a completely, uh, C is a completely artificial uh, designation. It has nothing to do with people's uh, uh, organic development and the organic development of, of, of Palestinian uh, so you communities. Could, you could have a house, you could, you could live in a house that's in area C and have and land in area B or vice versa. Yes, or vice versa, okay. yes. And how many Jewish settlers live in area C? So now, yeah, so Area C has become, of course, Area C is where the settlements are and the, most, the, the great majority of Israeli military positions. Mm -hmm. And they are close to, today, they are close, I mean, we assume that they are around between 350 to 400,000 uh, Israeli settlers. Mm -hmm. And there are about 200,000 uh, 200, in Jerusalem. OK. So this is mostly the area that's, um, that's on the Israeli side of the separation barrier. Not necessarily, no, no, not at all, not okay. at all. Many of the settlers, mo many of the settlers are on the on the eastern side, mm. and of course, I do not acknowledge the the, the, the separation wall yeah. as a as a border. It is not, and it is mo not meant to be. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, if it is security, so I don't consider this as a as a um, for as a start as, as a start. I don't consider it as a legitimate even uh, designation, but uh, no, but the great majority of settlers are on the, anyway, on the eastern side of the wall. So, so you have these, so you have seen over the last, recently you've seen an increase in, in home demolitions. The Israeli army has, has carried out home demolitions for a long time. What, what's changed? In what, how, have the, how has the number increased and you know, <coughs> who's being evicted? You know, we say home demolitions, and mm -hmm. the argument is that, that, yes, of course, it's illegal because people build uh, houses or homes, or very often it is shacks and tents, mm -hmm. uh, or, and even uh, cisterns to collect water. We're not, only right. we're not talking about wells, digging wells for drilling, but uh, water f uh, uh, cisterns to collect water. Rainwater, which they have to uh, they have to apply for permission to build, is that right? Yes, but okay. when once you don't have a master plan, you cannot apply for a permission. The, permit is, the Israeli authorities yes, don't have a master plan. Exactly, I see. So the Israeli authorities, who are the, 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 the in charge of the area and have been in charge since '67, developed dozens of master plans for for Israeli settlers, yeah. but they did not develop uh, uh, advocate master plans for Palestinians uh, mm. inhabitants. And uh, this is the reason that, this is the official reason why when people build, because also Palestinians have a natural uh, population growth, the population increases, but they don't get the permits to, to build so advocately. So, they have so you need, also, also uh, um, needs are changing. Mm -hmm. For example, Bedouin communities or semi-nomad communities, maybe 60 years ago they didn't, they didn't send their girls to, 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 to school. Mm -hmm. Now they do. And the girls want to study. Mm -hmm. So uh, they want to have schools. They want to have uh, clinics. They want to have uh, uh, light uh, so to read and to prepare for their uh, schooling. So they, can get, and they, they can't get permission. Yeah. For they don't get permission schools. for infrastructure, for connecting to the electricity, electricity. grid. Okay. So what happens that you see a, sit a settlement all lit up. And nearby, you have some uh, tents and shacks that have been there, th where the people have uh, been there for 50, 60, 80 years for before the settlement. Mm -hmm. And they uh, need to, to, to operate a generator two hours per day because more would be too expensive for them. So you've, you've noticed a, a, like a, a visible, like a remarkable increase in the pace of demolitions. Some of us, yes. I since mean, when? Uh, it, when? When did that start? We could say that since 2010, mm -hmm. There is an increase in the issuing in the number of demolition orders. Mm -hmm. And there is an increase of, with slight fluctuations in the uh, execution of those of demolition mm -hmm. orders in certain places, uh, in those places. Also, the change that we have noticed is that if until a uh, uh, few years ago, OK, the Israelis would come, and uh, it's mostly the civil administration, would come and demolish uh, two or three constructions in each community. Now they target entire communities. Mm -hmm. So they demolish the, 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 the structures of the entire community. Mm -hmm. Another increase, uh, very, very tangible, is the uh, Bedouin communities. There are many Bedouins in the area. Most of them, 
if not all, were actually expelled from Israel proper <coughs> in the 50s, in the 1950s. So they are in, uh, uh, their status is refugees, 1948 refugees. Then they, uh, they wandered with their sheep and uh, everybody to the West Bank. When Israel came in 67, they had for some years, they, could, they, they remained where they uh, were located. But slowly, slowly, their movement was restricted either by, uh, by designation of a great part of the Jordan Valley, for example, as military zone, military training zone, also in south of Hebron, military and then military and then uh, or natural reserves uh, areas, so that the Bedouins could not go there with their sheep. Mm -hmm. And with time, they okay, they 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 found some some uh, locations, and they, as respect to their uh, traditions, they cannot be people from different tribes. They, each tribe and each clan has to be on its own, and they are about. We assume around 90 such communities, in between 90 to 109 uh, such mostly communities. Like and in the last, in the West Bank, and mostly in Area C, mm -hmm. and in the last years, it is clear that the Israeli authorities intend to dislocate all those communities, Bedouin communities, against their will, and to regroup them and settle them in semi-urban neighborhoods, uh, which contradict their uh, style of life. Mm -hmm and which are very near the uh, uh, a, a and B zone. Hmm. So they're pushing them into They are pushing them, clearing the area, see? Mm -hmm. Clearing it. Mm -hmm. And not by accident, always these Bedouins are near an Israeli settlement. Mm -hmm. So uh, just, uh, 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 and in some cases, the settlements are involved in the petitions against those very communities. Mm -hmm. So there comes a, a settlement such as Kfar Edumim, uh, and has already petitioned three times to high court demanding to uh, demolish a nearby uh, Bedouin community, mm -hmm. which is there, of course, uh, in 20 years from, uh, from before the, the settlement itself, and including its school. It has a very uh, known school made of tires. Uh, oh, right, and there is an environmental yeah. And there is a demand yeah. to... to, to and the settlement demands to demolish all the shacks and the tents, including this school for around 150 or 180 children, mostly girls. Um, we see this is in the increase, uh, and there is more chutzpah to the to the demands. To the demands, yeah. to the demands. There is an Israeli uh, right-wing advocacy group called uh, Regavim. Uh, intended for the protection of the national nation's land. They, of course, uh, um, uh, claim that all, all land which has no direct private uh, owners is Jewish land, mm -hmm. uh, everywhere in, in, in the country between the river to the sea. And uh, they have engaged in the last years in pushing the civil administration to materialize, to execute the, 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 the already the demolition orders which has been issued over the years and were not, uh, yeah. were carried, not out. carried out. So you have an increase, you had uh, before so demolition. So they are pushing but, both the civil right. administration and the, the legal uh, and the legal system and high court. So before I move on to <coughs> ask Karim a couple of questions, I just want to clarify that some of the demolition orders that were sort of lying fallow for many years are suddenly being executed. Is that right? There yeah, were because the <coughs> usually people went to to the escort of uh, uh, lawyers. Mm -hmm. Lawyers petitioned against the demolition, mm -hmm. uh, and the high court accepted. And uh, the high court issued actually injunctions that mm. froze the situation. High Court did not challenge Israeli policies of discriminatory policies of developing for Israelis and not developing for Palestinians. Mm. It has not addressed this problem, principal problem, but it froze the situation. Okay, they would freeze them. Like it uh, yeah. postponed the decision till uh, later. But now the interference of uh, Regavim, mm -hmm. this uh, yeah, and also the wish of some judges to uh, to get rid of the pile of petitions that they had, un, un, uh, unclosed uh, petitions. Yeah. This came together, and also High Court is now um, uh, demanding Palestinians to to 
uh, exhaust uh, exhaust alikrim. Yeah, their um, their legal procedures. The legal procedures yeah. and to request a permit for construction. But you cannot request a permit for construction if because there is no, there is no master plan. Okay, I'm going to come back to the legal issues. I, um, Karim, you're the one who's supervising these field workers. They're the ones who are out with their video cameras and they're documenting what's going on. What I'd like you to do is just give us, uh, first of all, we'll start with just one example of a specific village or a specific family that was targeted by a demolition. Who are they? What happened to them? Yani, uh, I will uh, take an example from uh, the last uh, three days. Uh, before three days, we had uh, a few demolitions in uh, the Jordan uh, Valley area, in an area which is called Hamsa. Uh, the whole community there, uh, 12 structures, it became uh, demolished. Uh, next to Hamsa, there is another site which is called Karzalia. Karzalia, uh, the, uh, they live there, uh, one extended family three brothers, uh, each one uh, with uh, his uh, kids, yani one of uh, them, Zohair, which they uh, demolished uh, yesterday for, uh, for two days for him. He has uh, six uh, kids. He lived uh, with, her, uh, with his uh, uh, wife, and he had, and uh, their uh, six kids, and uh, his uh, old father and his old uh, mother. Uh, the area of Karzalia, it's in the north of the west uh, uh, of the uh, Jordan Valley area. In order to reach uh, Karzalia, you have to drive in a uh, very broken road, in a uh, jeep uh, 4x4, in order to reach the, uh, the site, more than 40 minutes. Uh, between the hills, they are located uh, there. In a very small piece of land, a plain uh, piece of land, they used to live the three families together, uh, one next to the other. Uh, before three months, for the first time they came, the Israeli army came and they demolished all the structures uh, there. They became without a roof uh, for uh, two days. Later they bring uh, tents and they rebuilt their tents. Uh, the second time the army came and demolished their uh, structures. Uh, the, for the second time they rebuilt. The third time they came and they demolished after one week uh, all the structures. Uh, then they rebuilt, but this time they rebuilt their houses in uh, separated. Each one, each family, they hold one of the hills around. And in the beginning, they were uh, very isolated in this area. Now they became more isolated because the distance between uh, the families became hundreds of meters, each family in the top of a hill. And the closest one to the, uh, uh, to the axis was Zohair. For two days, they came and they demolished for Zohair his uh, tent and uh, the structures there. And Zohair became without uh, any place uh, to uh, live. These families, uh, they have no water. They are not connected to the uh, water network. And they used to, uh, to have a pipe from a spring close to them. In the uh, first demolitions, they cut the pipes. So now they don't have a water. And in order to have a water, they have to carry uh, Buckets. Yeah, uh, and to bring the water. And imagine these families, they are shepherd families. They have hundreds of uh, goats, uh, uh, heads of goats. So imagine how can they manage their life in uh, such as uh, uh, conditions. Uh, not only in Homsa and Karzalia, the demolitions. Uh, in Jawana, which is an area next to Nablus, Shechem, in the uh, southeast of uh, 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 also there they demolished uh, eight uh, structures and when we talk about the structures we talk about families we talk about kids we talk about uh, people living from uh, 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 shabbering so they have a goats so even the goats the small goats when in the, uh, the previous uh, demolitions in Karzalia uh, they died and we have uh, uh, pictures and uh, we filming uh, in one of the, the demolitions, uh, cow baby, calf, <laughs> yeah, uh, killed uh, under these uh, demolitions. So the demolitions affect the life of the people and the, uh, even the animals in this uh, in these areas. So, so you filmed these incidents. You have videos and uh, other. 
yeah, evidence? Uh, we try uh, to uh, document, يعني, we use to document all the by uh, uh, writing uh, uh, reports, printing out uh, reports. But at uh, the last uh, few years, we start the visual documentation. Uh, we have uh, more than 200 uh, cameras uh, distributed in the field uh, with the Palestinian volunteers. They document all these, uh, uh, the settlers' violence against them. Mm -hmm. They uh, document also the demolitions from time to time. So we have uh, documented uh, uh, films. But many times when they, uh, the question of the demolitions, yeah. the families, they are not, uh, uh, they don't have a time to use the camera in order to document the, the demolition against themselves. They are, uh, uh, yeah, they want to package their uh, uh, things. They want to hold the, their, their uh, kids, they want mm -hmm. to protect uh, their animals. Mm -hmm. So in many times we are, we didn't succeed to uh, film th the uh, things happening in the ground, except if our field researchers uh, reach the area. And we have uh, uh, documentations, a few, but uh, we have also to, to think about the pain of the people mm -hmm. at that time, which they cannot think about the camera and they cannot uh, uh, think about the documentation, sure. which is uh, difficult for me. <coughs> so, um, I have two questions for you. The first one is, um, can you explain, do these families receive any advance notice before the soldiers come to destroy their homes? Uh, usually, uh, in uh, the uh, Area C, generally, and in the, er in, uh, the Jordan Valley uh, area, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, demolition orders, they distribute all the time to these uh, communities. Uh, many communities, they tried to, uh, to apply for uh, per uh, building permits in over because they give them a time. You have uh, to get a building uh, uh, permit. Mm. Either you will uh, uh, be demolished or your house will be uh, demolished. Uh, but uh, the, the, pr the problem there that uh, the people they, or the areas, they don't have a master plans. And when you apply for the master plan, it became refused from the uh, authorities. Mm -hmm. And according to the international law, Israel, the occupying power, it's supposed to supply a master plan for the communities. For community planning. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for example, uh, more than 90% from the uh, uh, applications for master plans, it became rejected by the Israeli uh, side. And the 10%, which is approved, it's only to uh, cover the built up area of the uh, Palestinians. And I will give you a small example from the Northern Jordan Valley, a uh, village in the name of Jiftlik. El Jiftlik uh, people, they apply for a master plan. The uh, different uh, Israeli uh, organization help them to apply, like BIMCOM, which is uh, uh, Israel uh, it's an organization. Jerusalem planning organization. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, they deal with the planning issues. Uh, after a year, they get uh, the master plan of Jiftlik. But the master plan of Jiftlik, it covered only 60% from the built up area of the uh, village. Hmm. But you have to know a few facts about Jiftlik, about the master plan of the Jiftlik. It covered 590 donums. Was that as hectares? I Divided know. by four for acres. Yeah, uh, 400, uh, uh, 590 dollars. The population of uh, Jiftlik, it's uh, 5,300 inhabitants. In the other side, two kilometers from or three kilometers from Jiftlik, we have an Israeli settlement, which is called Maskiot. The uh, master plan of Maskiot, it covered 690 dollars. That means 100 drums more than the master plan of Jiftlik. But you have to know that the, the inhabitants of Muskiot, there are only 200. So in the, uh, in the planning uh, issues between the Palestinians and the, the, the uh, Israeli settlers in the side area C, uh, they took the uh, future needs of the uh, Muskiot uh, for uh, uh, planning zones, for schools, for everything. But when uh, the uh, planning come to the Palestinians, it's just the built up area without any opportunity for the developing in the future of these uh, communities. Mm -mm. Uh, another uh, small example mm -hmm. about the applications of the permits. Uh, according to the statistics fr given from the civil administration between uh, the year 2000 and 2012, uh, the Palestinians applied in the area C 
for uh, 3,700 uh, 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 building permits. They get only 211. That time, the Israeli side supply uh, more than 15,000 uh, building permits for the right. settlements in the area C. So, so Amira, you have this uh, this incredible disparity that Karim just described, and you have this you know visible increase in in demolitions of Palestinian homes and infrastructure, and you've you've talked about the courts just wanting to clear the files and just push through the bureaucracy. Are there any other? Has there been any official statements of policy from <coughs> the Israeli authorities why they're why they're pushing Palestinians towards Area B? No, or? that's exactly where where they say we abide by the law, and there is. Uh, uh, they don't disclose what is behind this policy. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I asked, as a journalist, I asked uh, the civil administration how many communities they have demolished since uh, uh, the end of 2012. And they told me, we do not demolish uh, communities. We are only uh, uh, abiding by the law and uh, demolishing houses which were built illegally. So they even refused to. But we have, after so many years <coughs> of uh, following and, 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 and scrutinizing and uh, uh, seeing Israeli policies on the ground, we have the right to analyze it and not just to wait for secret documents to be released or when they are released. And uh, since it's obvious, like uh, uh, when you have, uh, you have the settlements on the one hand, and actually these policies, these discriminatory policies, are the mirror image of the settlements. Because while you expand the settlements, you expand them on Palestinian land. So you don't allow Palestinians to develop in their own land in order for settlements to expand over there. And uh, so I feel 200% uh, confident to tell there is a very, the Israeli intention is to make this, to guarantee that there are uh, uh, as few Palestinians as possible in this area. So that it'll be a, they'll be able to, to annex it to Israel, not only de facto, as it is today, mm. but de jure. Mm. There is a story about this uh, high of, uh, mid official, in, uh, mid, in the mid level official at the Israeli civil administration, who spoke with a UN person, I won't mention whom, um, and he wanted to share with him a joke. He said, Oh, do you know what is ABC? Mm. A is Arafat. So the area belongs to Arafat. B is for Balagan. Balagan is, in Hebrew is a lot of mess. It's, it's very messy because you have uh, Israeli control over, over security and police and Palestinian control over uh, administrative and civilian affairs. And C, he said, C is for Shelanu, ours in Hebrew. Never heard that so, one. Yeah. So this is, this is a joke, but a joke which, which uh, conveys what they really think about the reality. And indeed, in, ver in several places that I interviewed people whose homes were demolished, they told me that they spoke when the soldiers came and uh, tore down their tents or uh, uh, shacks. They asked them, so where do you want us to go to? Right. Where sh what shall we do? And the soldiers told them very candidly, go to Area A ah, or go to Arafat. So it's also one of the things that I've learned as a journalist over the years. Mm -hmm. I always learn much more from the lower echelons than from the higher echelons because, because they know how to camouflage the intentions. Yeah. The lower echelons say what they hear in the corridors or from there directly. They hear it and they say it frankly. And uh, indeed, in many of these places, it's, it's a very sad uh, uh, phenomenon. You go to villages. Where Israel does not, which Israel does not allow to, to uh, uh, develop and to build. And the young, young youngsters leave it. Mm -hmm. They go indeed to Area A because they cannot. Uh, for example, there is this village, Nabi Samuel. Uh, uh, the old constructions, the, the old building there from, from dating back uh, hundreds of years, tell that there has been a, 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 an ongoing Palestinian or ongoing in, in inhabitants for, 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 for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, the place uh, in, was conquered in 67. Then in 71, uh, then there was no B'Tselem and no high court. Mm -hmm. uh, the Israeli <laughs> forces came and demolished the houses and old constructions, very beautiful. They demolished the houses and told the people to uh, just leave. 
luckily, so the people moved 200 meters away to some other constructions of the building, which belonged to people of the, of the village, which belonged to people who had fled after 67. So they actually went to houses which they do not own, and were, that's where they live till today. But the Israelis do not allow them to develop and to build there in thousands of tricks. The la one of them is to declare the whole area as a uh, nature reserve zone. So they are not, not even allowed to plant a, 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 a tree in their own uh, yard because it, they have to ask for a permit for this because it's a natural reserve zone. So that's where, ex that's where people uh, have left, uh, young people, for years they lived together with their families in two rooms, but now the kids grew up, they cannot be anymore together in the same room, or two families in the same, uh, in the same two, 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 two rooms be, uh, house, and people are living to, an, to another place. Because they can't a get part married. Of other, they yeah, a part, yeah. They, they get married. I started a case where a guy got married, and uh, because it is now an isolated village, and it is in between the, the the, 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 the fence, so, uh, something very, in a, in a zone that became completely, almost 100% empty of Palestinians. And it is one of those zones that has been de facto annexed to Israel, uh, near the settlements of Givat Ze'ev and others, give, give on. He's, he is not able to bring his wife home. Hmm. Like, because she needs, because they go through a checkpoint and they need to write their names. And, they created such a bureaucracy that if you are not one of the place, it takes ages until your name is registered at the checkpoint so that you can enter the village. So you need a, a, a husband needs a, check, a, a permit for his wife to come to her, her home, which and he, he does not, get. which he doesn't get. It. Okay. So, so, so you uh, have yeah. just you forget uh, Amira the school, uh, the school of uh, no no the school of the village uh, mm. of uh, uh, Nabi Samuel. Uh, in uh, the Jordanian time, they had a very small school, which is one room, only one room. Uh, they applied many times to get uh, more than rooms in order to uh, serve the, uh, the kids of the, uh, the village. They didn't uh, get any permits. So now they have four uh, groups, uh, the first class, second class, third class, fourth class in the same room, and the teachers get this group uh, 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 10 minutes, this group 10 minutes, this group 10 minutes, and by that way they learn the kids. Because they cannot go, if you, they want to go to learn in the next village, which is about uh, uh, 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers, they have to bring a car, or, uh, it's very complicated. So the kids in the early age, they have to learn in this school, and four classes in the same room, so you That's have, the you have a one-room schoolhouse yeah. for grades one through four. Yeah. And before they close the area, before the, the actually the village has been uh, uh, encircled by checkpoints, uh, okay, the kids could go to nearby villages and study and, and learn there. But now, in order to get to a village which is uh, maybe ten minutes uh, dist walk, uh, distance uh, in walking, now they have to make a detour which takes them about half an hour in driving. Uh, in order mm -hmm. to get so these are and and uh, this is a very strategic zone for Israel, and the intention is clear. I mean, you don't uh, uh, the the intention has been there for since since long before Oslo, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it is done in the in a very incremental way so that you see and then you talk about legality. Okay, so and actually, I want to ask you about legality. I mean, do does let's say a Palestinian. Like first of all, the situation that you two have described is obviously untenable, and it's impossible to live like that. It's very unjust. Someone's house is being demolished. They want to pro they want to take this to the legal. They want legal recourse. Do they have legal recourse? Can they go? Can yeah. they get it? Can they hire an Israeli lawyer and but go to a court? Of course. I mean, th but this, the question should not start there. Mm. The basis is that we have to legal systems, one for Jews, one for Palestinians. Living in both living areas. In, yeah, yeah, in this, uh, yeah. Uh, so in, in the West Bank you have, so any one of you who is Jewish here in this room, you can immediately, to d you can decide tomorrow to emigrate to Israel, and you can live in Area C and get full rights in Area C. As a citizen you can of get Israel. As a citizen of Israel, and even as a visitor, and even as a, as a temporary uh, uh, resident. resident. You can go and live in any settlement in the West Bank, 
have water, have electricity, have all kinds of subsidies, enjoy the roads, enjoy everything, if you are a Jew. But if you're a Palestinian, uh, Karim, for example, cannot move and live in Area C. He will not be able to, to, to first of all, he's in, in danger of, uh, uh, if he moves to Area C, he will lose his uh, uh, status as a resident of Jerusalem. And if he were not, if you were from the Ramallah, if you, in, you are in Ramallah, and even if you have your private land in Area C, uh, you cannot build there because uh, you, know, you are subject to Israeli uh, uh, restrictions. So this is where it starts, that the legal, legality is from the start uh, one set of laws for Jews, mm -hmm. which allows them development, and the other one which restricts development of the Palestinians. So actually, I'd, I'd like to ask you briefly, Karim, when you're doing, when you're doing your field work as a Palestinian resident of East Jerusalem, when you're traveling around Area C, if you, ha, has it ever happened that you were accompanied by a Jewish Israeli colleague and you had a confrontation with Israeli soldiers? Did they treat you differently in those cases? Yeah, it happened a lot. All the time we are moving in, uh, in the field uh, with uh, my colleagues from the video department, from the different departments in the, the organization. We became stopped in the checkpoints from time to time. Sometimes when there are uh, demolitions and we want to reach the uh, demolition uh, area. Uh, they prevent us from entering there. They stop us until they finish their uh, uh, work there, which is the uh, uh, demolitions. Uh, but not more than uh, that. Uh, yeah, we have uh, at least uh, because I hold an Israeli ID card. Right. Or, uh, maybe it's a privilege for me that mm -hmm. I'm a Jerusalem resident and I have the Jerusalem ID card, which is the Israeli uh, ID card, so I can move mm -hmm. more free than my colleagues, my team, for example, the even uh, field researchers, which they are uh, from the West Bank. They cannot enter our office uh, in, in Jerusalem. In, Jerusalem. Uh, in many places, they cannot uh, move uh, and uh, their movement is uh, all the time restricted. Uh, but as a, a Jerusalem resident, mm -hmm. as Amira mentioned, if I live outside the municipality borders of Jerusalem, they confiscate my right to return back to Jerusalem and to live in Jerusalem again. I have an American brother now. He lives in uh, Houston. Uh, when he gets the American citizenship, they confiscate his identity card. And now when he came to the uh, country, he came as a, a, a visitor, as a tourist, and as a, not as a, 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 a the guy born which there, he, he yeah. born there and yeah. his father and his grandfather born there and he have a house there. He cannot live in his uh, house. He has to visit his own country where he uh, yeah, has yeah, a tourist. Uh, uh, yeah, a visa, tourist uh, visa, yeah. uh, which is a very uh, sad uh, situation to, to, to worry all the time. And it's uh, uh, the situation of uh, thousands of uh, Palestinians inside uh, East uh, Jerusalem, which they live all the time under the fear that they will lose their uh, 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 legal uh, uh, status inside the East uh, Jerusalem if they uh, live outside the municipality of Jerusalem. So all the time they have to, to hold uh, papers, papers, papers in order to prove that you are existing here and you are uh, in, in this uh, city. If you don't have these papers, uh, these bills from the telephone, from the water, from the uh, Arnona, which is the uh, uh, municipal tax, uh, you will lose your ID card, you will lose your uh, place in uh, your own city. So you become stateless twice over. Of course. Right. So um, we're going to, I just wanted to ask you if we can, before we move on to questions, I'm going to bring Anat in to talk about that, but in a minute, but I just wanted to talk first about um, what we discussed yesterday, which was the, the disparity in resource allocation between Jewish settlements and Palestinian villages in the area C in terms of water, for example. Um, if you can talk a little bit about that. Um, the main resource, of course, is water and electricity. And uh, <coughs> uh, because there are no master plans, most of the Palestinian communities in Area C are not connected to the electricity. Mm. Uh, and the authorities refuse to connect them. Mm. Uh, then the water, when, uh, the same with, goes with water. Right. So you have, uh, uh, you have about... Uh, you see those communities, those 90, those uh, 90, uh, around 270 communities which are solely in Area C, 
uh, and with 90,000 people, uh, you see that they depend on cisterns, on uh, rain, uh, rain collecting of rainwater, and uh, as, the, as their ancestors did uh, <coughs> 100 years ago, or they bring uh, water in tanks. Which they pay. Uh, yes, for, for the which they pay about four times the, 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 the because they pay for the solar for the for the fuel they pay they pay more than they for they pay for the water, mm. uh, or sometimes when there is a very uh, uh, in a merciful situation in some places there was some good Israeli military commander uh, some 30, 40 years ago they can go to a nearby uh, pipe which brings water to a settlement. And it's, uh, they don't have to go miles uh, in order to bring water, but only a few uh, meters away, like Bir el Eid. Uh, but nearby, you see the settlement. So when, first, when you go, the, 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 those of you who have not been there, first you have to imagine <coughs> that you see a lush community of, uh, OK, even new houses. But it's always lush. There is always green. There is always uh, uh, trees. There are always pool. trees. And the, and even if not a swimming pool, then the, the water is, uh, the sprinkles uh, uh, everywhere. And nearby, you see how a, a, a community of shacks and tents mm -hmm. without any, uh, any water. The statistic differs. I mean, statistic differs. It can be as you, uh, 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 in mostly in those Jordan Valley communities, you can have around 400 uh, liters per day per, per person. Mm -hmm when it's a settler, and around 20 to 30 or 40 to a Palestinian liters per day, which is much below the minimum. What is the minimum, actually? The minimum, the minimum, the, 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 the human minimum uh, varies between, uh, I think, 80 to 100. A day? Yes, a and day. You have very hot climate, and these very are hot also climate, agrarian of course, people. Of course, so they have yes. To, okay. So in one of the stories that I covered, I uh, went to one of those villages, uh, and El Beda, that used to have seven springs before 67. They used to have seven springs in, the, in, the, in their village. This was the whole, the Jordan Valley is, is, is rich with water. And uh, that was from the start what the Israeli meant to do is to <coughs> drill there and to drill water and to have uh, wells which uh, give water to the Israeli settlements. And that's what they did. So they had a deal with the village that instead of the spring water, which dried because of the drilling, mm -hmm. they would get uh, the same quantity from Mekot, from the Israeli company, water company. With time, the quantities go down, mm -hmm. but also the people increase. So they need more water, and they do not, the, 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 the do not get as much as they. Uh, and they have, they cannot cultivate anymore their 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 fields. You so can see that with, with every plot you have one plot which yeah. is cultivated, yeah. but always very uh, 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 crops that do, do not need much water, like cabbage. And nearby, so and then some plots are dry because they cannot afford; they don't have the water. And nearby, you have area that has been confiscated by the settlements, mm -hmm. uh, and has bananas which need a lot of water. Right. And it's so striking. And they're really I side mean, by side. You can and walk side by side, like you know, you yeah. go and then you see the orchards also, the, the, the oranges. And the same thing, the also the oranges need a lot of water. And I know, I mean, I checked, but of mm. course, yes, it, is, it belongs to a settlement, mm. not to a Palestinian. Side by side, you know, a meter to one meter here, one meter there. Mm -hmm. And this is so striking. This is uh, uh, so infuriating. And, and I, as an Israeli Jew, I'm, I'm filled with shame to see this, uh, this the discrepancy. I knew it in Gaza when I lived in Gaza, and I know it today in, in, in the West Bank. I live when I, where I live. It's not Area C, but where I live in, 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 in the West Bank, in El Bire, uh, in summer, we don't have enough water, so we, we have to, 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 to save water uh, in summer. And just a few, uh, one kilometer away is the settlement of Bet El, and I see the difference. Right. And there it's uh, full. This is the policy of, of uh, 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 such uh, blat blatant uh, discrimination and uh, double standards that, um, uh, that accompanies us and is in the, at, the, at the basis of all the problems that we, can, uh, that we discussed. And maybe Kerry has not discussed it, <laughs> but uh, this, is, this is at the bottom 
of all of all this conflict. Okay. Can and then, and then we'll move to Annette. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. When we talk about the water issues, even, even the Palestinians, uh, which they live in area A and area B, which is supposed to be under the full Palestinian control, they get uh, their uh, supplies of water by Mukorot. It's controlled by the Israeli side. So in the summer uh, time, uh, all the Palestinian cities, which are under the full control of the PA, they suffered from lack of water. And in many uh, cases, they get uh, water once or uh, uh, a week or once or two weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very important fact that uh, it's not the only Palestinians who suffered from the lack of water C, yeah. in area C. And according to one uh, of our uh, uh, reports from mm -hmm. 2010 about the Jordan Valley, we discovered by statistics uh, uh, getting from Mukorot and from different resources that the uh, 10,000 even less than 10,000 settlers living in the Jordan Valley area, they consume a third of the, uh, uh, the total consume of the 2.5 uh, million Palestinians. Mm -hmm. The 10,000, they, yeah, they get... One third of the one water. Yeah. This, water is, yeah. this is yeah. actually, n this yeah. is Palestinian water. Like yeah. It's yeah. And it is yeah. Palestinian yeah. water, yeah. yes. Okay. Just uh, to... Yeah. And I mean, I know I was, I've been in Bethlehem in the summertime when they just didn't have water for eight, ten days at a time. You turn the tap on and nothing comes. Okay. Um, do we have a microphone for Anat? She's, okay. So Anat is, this is Anat Saragusti. She's the director of uh, the B'Tselem office here, the B'Tselem USA office here in Washington, D.C. And um, she's just going to speak about a new initiative they're undertaking. Apropos. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you, everybody. Do you hear me? Great. Okay, B'Tselem um, basically is a uh, human rights, Israeli human rights organization that collects uh, information and monitor and um, data and issue reports on the, um, the status of the uh, human rights of uh, the Palestinian occupied territories. Uh, and here in B'Tselem USA, we decided to take the issue of home demolitions and as our um, main issue for this uh, coming year. And why is that so? First of all, because there is an increase, a, a dramatic increase, a significant increase in home demolitions in the last two, three years that we, we monitored and we have the, all the data and statistics about it. Um, and the issuing of new um, demolition orders uh, in the West Bank. So this is one reason why we took this. Um, the other reason is that, you know, everybody speaks about status quo. There is no status quo. Things are happening on the ground as we speak. So even if they freeze, quote unquote, the, the, the expansion or the building of the settlements, things on the ground are happening. And this is very much regard to the, to the um, uh, home demolitions. Because the home demolitions issue is the mirror issue of the, of the settlements. And nobody speaks about home demolitions. And when people speak about home demolitions, they usually they tend to do it on a, on a humanitarian framing. It is a humanitarian framing. I mean, a, a family that her, their home has been demolished, it's a humanitarian case. I'm not arguing that, but it's also um, something more than that because it's, it's a system and it's a systemic issue because it's not only one family here and one family there that their home has been demolished. Um, there is an intention, as Amira said, there is an intention to confiscate or to annex or to free more and more lands for the for settlements to expand. So when Israel expands the settlements, it comes from somewhere. It doesn't, it, it's not I, uh, done in, in a vacuum. So it, it goes on the same line as, as the home demolitions or the evacuation of, of uh, communities. When you see when we see the evacuation of communities, that it, it's in very strategic areas that they want to expand the, the settlements there. So it's very important for us as B'Tselem, you know, to, to point this out so people will understand when they speak about the settlement what it means, you know. It's not Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Americans. There, there is a context that these things are, are happening, right? So this is our, you know, kind of framing. And the fact that Israel is now trying to reframe everything into the legal uh, framework is very tricky because they, they demand the Palestinians to, to provide evidence of their ownership on the land on, on an individual basis. But this is also a systemic issue. It's not individual. <coughs> and they demand the Palestinians to prove that they paid 
taxes to the Ottomans, you know, in the beginning of the, of the 20th century to prove their ownership of the land. This is only one method. And everybody knows that the Israeli legal system is very um, strong, it's very credible, there is due process there, so everything is done in a very orderly manner. But it's nothing there is orderly. So this is what is important for us, you know, to highlight, you know, the other more dark uh, picture of, of the broader, um, um, let's say, uh, reality in, in the West Bank and the, in the, you know, conflict so to say, between the Israelis and Palestinians, it's more of an o occupation. And this is, this is what the occupation is, is made of, <laughs> these issues. So it was very important for me to clarify this and you know, to put the framework of what we're doing <coughs> here in the US. And our goal is, you know, at the end of the day, to call for a moratorium on home abolitions. As long as Israel doesn't provide uh, alternatives to Palestinians, doesn't provide master plans, doesn't allocate um, um, lands for the, the development of, of Palestinian public services, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, public needs <laughs> that should be stopped to, to demolish homes and evacuate communities. This is our goal here. And uh, we would like uh, each and every one of you, you know, you, you can approach us and uh, we can supply any information and, um, that you will need. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to open up for questions now, um, please. Oh, just wait for the mic, sorry. <coughs> My name is um, Daniel Nuremberg. I'm a, should I stand? I don't know. I'm a PhD student at George Washington University. Um, I just came back from doing research in the West Bank. Um, and I, I came here with the book States of Denial. I noticed that somebody else has it here, so it's obviously relevant to this topic. Um, and one of the stories in here is this uh, apocryphal story of someone who goes to a British civil servant and asks him whether British policy in the Middle East is uh, ignorance or indifference? And his answer is, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> and uh, both of you have to deal with and, and choose to deal with the Israeli public, um, either through media or through human rights organizations. And I'm wondering what the reaction is from the Israeli public. Do you find that there are people that you can communicate with? Are there particular strategies you use to reach out to a very uh, stubborn society that is probably, well, fairly unwilling to look at some of these issues and to take them seriously? So, so the question is, uh, are, Israelis, uh, can, are Israelis aware and do they, uh, yeah, and do they respond? Yeah, are aware and then if, if, um, if they're not, how do you reach out to them and what, what are the strategies that would be counter effective? Well, Amir, you write about this for the Haaretz newspaper. Yeah. How many people read, how many Israelis read Haaretz newspaper? I guess it's a secret that, that my paper would not like me to... Uh, uh, no, it's not a secret, I can tell. <laughs> you can tell. Yeah. Uh, only 7% of Israelis who read a newspaper daily read Haaretz. Which doesn't mean they all read what we write about the occupation. Right, can it's also like, oh, it's Amir it has turned the page. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But, uh, so but, but you also have the videos. Okay, so tell us. Look, um, this has been one of my discoveries, of course, or realizations over the past 20 years that I'm covering the, uh, actually the occupation, Israeli occupation, is that we have in Israel, we have, we really enjoy the, the, the freedom of uh, uh, speech. Uh, we enjoy the right to, to exercise our right for freedom of speech and opinion. I can write, but the public doesn't have the obligation, the duty to know and to read. So this is a big difference. And um, there is willful ignorance. It has not changed since then. And I, I, I see it everywhere. I'm here now for four or five days in Washington. And you, you see, the, dis you see the, the exploitation. And you see the, 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 the discrimination here in Washington. And it's nothing peculiar. It's nothing unique to Israelis. Let's be, let's be clear about that. Uh, and you have your own history of uh, discrimination. Uh, it's, uh, we have not invented it. Um, so we need tricks, you know, like uh, as a journalist, I would need tricks. So I have, uh, I'm, uh, uh, and with my editors and myself, we look for uh, a, an interesting uh, headline or, or uh, um, something with it which is catchy. And so is Betselem. Uh, Betselem has a, a, a genius uh, 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 program of several years to give to around to more than 200 volunteers all over the West Bank cameras, video cameras, mm -hmm. uh, in places of friction with both the army and uh, the settlement settlers. 
And everything that we have been writing, including B'Tselem, and people did not believe us because there is no proof. So you know, Palestinians are liars. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and leftists also are liars. So then you get the, 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 the videos, and then all of a sudden, oh, 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 this. Uh, so true that now the army says, oh, they have edited, and this is an edited film, etc. But you see it. It does attract attention for some days, but then it, the dies truth down. is that it dies down. Yeah. No, but it, those videos so those the videos people get the television. knowledge, you know, when people when people profit from the situation because we are talking about a reality that the majority of Israelis profit from. I mean, occupation pays is worthwhile for Israelis as it has been as occupation has been and colonialism has been worthwhile for many others. <coughs> um, so. As long as this goes on without much harm, and you get, you profit, you don't want to know. That's the rule. When you say harm, you mean no physical insecurity? No, I don't mean, yes, this is not. I mean, that when, where you start to be challenged, this, this, this uh, uh, if you can uh, move to a settlement, and, 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 and uh, then at the same time be admitted all over during the world as uh, uh, just another state which is, uh, belongs to the West, and uh, be, be cherished for uh, all your achievements and science achievements, then you don't feel that there is any harm in uh, that, 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 that when, when you are being criticized for living in a settlement, but in practice being hugged, even if you live in a settlement, and even if you develop that settlement, mm. uh, you continue, and you continue not to know. Right. And now there is a generation, so many generations of youngsters who were born into this situation. 30, 40 years ago, I could sense some shame among the Israeli politicians and others. That this, like, if you said that a Palestinian gets one fourth of water, uh, 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 or gets less water than an Israeli, they would say, no, impossible. We are not like this. Mm -hmm. Now, OK, who cares? They don't need more. So now the, the, the answer would be they don't need more. And you also hear a, a shift in, com in the terminology is amongst the right wing. It, now it's, they're calling it, instead of occupied, they call it administered territory. No, this has be always been. The administered yeah. has always been a kind of a euf the euphemism used by Israeli. Uh, hmm. uh, and even in, in Haaretz, for many years, it was uh, said, it was written, the administered uh, territory. Uh, no, the settlers, uh, look, you see, when you go, when you drive in Area C, this is one of the most striking things. The road signs don't give the names of Palestinian villages. They do not exist. They give the road signs of Israeli settlements. The smallest Israeli settlement, you have a sign. But you don't have the signs of uh, Palestinian communities. And I, I have, um, yes, and this is, this <coughs> is very uh, striking. This is one of the, so you drive on those huge roads that connect Tel Aviv to, 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 to Male Ephraim, which is a settlement in the Jordan Valley. And you don't have any idea that you already drive outside of Israel, mm. that you are in the West Bank. Because all the signs tell you that you are in, a, in an Israeli territory. Sure. I mean, people who live in Malay Adomim or Pisgat they sure. say they live in Jerusalem. They live in Jerusalem, yes. yes. And yeah. in, in fact, they don't. And in Israel. A lot of them say that they don't even know that they live in settlements. They mm. consider mm. themselves they are not, not settlers. Because in a mm. strange way, so people say, oh, settlers, they must be all these lunatics who go and run on the hills with the big kippahs. Mm. But no, settlers is uh, people who live in Jerusalem in Sheikh Jarrah. They are settlers because they are uh, 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 in the sense that they. they, they uh, 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 they are criminals according to international law, all of them, including, and what, what happens is that parents force their children to be criminals. Hmm. The, the, the settlers' parents force their children to be criminals. And they teach them, they, they, they grow them, they, 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 they uh, uh, from year to year to grow as criminals. Yes. Um, sorry, back back here with the green scarf. Oh, and then we'll get to you right after that. My name, my name is Allison Glick. And first, I'd like to thank you, Amira, for all the work that you've done all these years. I lived in the West Bank of Gaza in the late '80s during the first Intifada, around the time you started your reporting. And it was, it's just amazing what you've done. And I know it hasn't been easy. And Kareem, to you, when I was doing human rights work in Gaza. Although you weren't with B'Tselem, they were great allies. That's the first thing I want to say. Amira, to you, you talked about um, 
the hallway discussions that you had with lower level soldiers or officials. Could you talk a little bit more about those types of conversations, um, whether it's with Israelis, with soldiers, with government officials, with Americans, with internationals, and to el sort of elucidate more what, what those individuals think. I'm also going to Individuals who are... Uh, yeah, what well, you talked about how you can get more, almost more accurate information of what's really happening ah, okay. by talking to yeah. unofficials, let's call okay. them. Um, I'd also like to ask you quickly if, he's, if you've read Max Blumenthal's book, Goliath. He spoke about the book here a few months ago, although there was immense pressure to not have him talk here. Um, and Kareem, if you could talk about pressure from the government that B'Tselem has been under to basically stop or, uh, or um, inhibit your work, B'Tselem's work. <coughs> Uh, about our work as uh, Salem, I don't uh, think that uh, we have pressure, uh, direct pressure to stop our work. Uh, yani we use the Israeli democracy in order to do uh, our work, but w there were uh, talks in uh, different uh, standards in the Knesset or uh, Knesset members from uh, the uh, right uh, about uh, thinking about ways to stop the uh, uh, funding of uh, Salem and other human rights uh, organizations. But uh, we didn't uh, uh, feel and see that we are targeted uh, by uh, the pressure. But uh, I will above uh, something uh, uh, from the question which you uh, pointed to Amira. Uh, to get uh, things from the uh, normal people or uh, soldiers or something like that. Uh, it's uh, uh, before a few months in Hebron, the Israeli army started to build a fence in order to divide uh, a road and to give uh, the Palestinians a very, very narrow road, and the rest of the road, it used to be for the uses of the settlers. Mm -hmm. So our field researchers, they run there, and uh, they start to film that. And uh, one of the soldiers asked Musa, our field researcher, uh, you are not allowed to, to, uh, to be here. Go back from the narrow area. And Musa start to discuss that, why, why? he told him, it's only for the Jewish. This area is for the Jewish. The other area is for the Arabs. We get this video and we give it to the Israeli media. The uh, Israeli uh, public became shocked from that. And uh, in the same day or the next day, uh, the army changed the uh, rules there and they opened the street for, for the uh, Palestinians. And the mistake of the soldier, which he announced that, it, uh, yani, solved the problem for the uh, people in the, in, the, in the area, so. Hmm. I can give you an example. Um, there is a road that goes out of, uh, of Ramallah to, you, you have a way to go out of Ramallah to Jerusalem for those who have permits or those who are Jerusalemites, that you have to go through Kalandia a Kalandia checkpoint which is usually in the morning very, uh, really jammed. So s s several people prefer those who, have, uh, who, who are allowed to enter Jerusalem, but not West Bank, only Jerusalemites, uh, make a little detour and go uh, converge with the road of settlers uh, to another checkpoint, which is destined for Israelis. You have checkpoints only for Palestinians, and you have checkpoints only uh, for Israelis. So they would go with the checkpoint for Israelis. And then it's especially in the morning, and now since the settlers, as, uh, you can count by the, 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 you can see by the number of cars that how uh, the settlers community has uh, grown. Uh, usually in the morning, the, there are traffic jams. Mm -hmm. And settlers get upset, and the uh, police gets upset. So for some time, every morning, at the exit from the Palestinian road, there was a police uh, car checking, stopping the, 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 the traffic and checking the cars. And you know, you can say, they say security. They say that there is for security reasons. But then the flow of settlers' cars continues towards the checkpoint for Israelis. Uh, when I suggested it to the authorities that this is in order to uh, free the traffic from Palestinians, they said, oh no, of course not. This is for security reasons. 
And we all heard that this is for security reasons. Uh, reason says differently, and experience says differently. Then a friend of ours from Breaking the Silence, who is uh, 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 from an Orthodox family and still an Orthodox Jew, he uh, called me very <laughs> once, we were very excited. He went to see an old friend who, what can we say, what can we do, lives in a settlement. He said, believe me, it's the only time, and I stayed over uh, during the weekend, <laughs> but believe me, this is the only, because he had to talk, and, and the young children spoke around the table. And they said, you see, now there is no traffic, no traffic jams, because they are blocking the, so the kids heard it from neighbors, from, from settlers who were involved in it. At a certain time, I, 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 maybe the last time that I spoke to some commanders who invited me to talk to them. Um, Army commanders. Army commanders, yes. And one of them told me that indeed they were sitting with the police. They talked about also about this traffic jam, which is a big issue. Um, and they, uh, the police said, well, this is irritating. How about us forcing all Israeli pal citizens who are Palestinians to go through Kalandia, through the Palestinians only checkpoint, and not to go through the Israeli checkpoint. Uh, and the commanders told, said, and it was off the record, so don't quote me, uh, the commander said, we had to explain to them why it is illegal, uh, that you cannot force an Israeli. But you see it in checkpoints, certain checkpoints for Israelis, how they treat Palestinians who are Israeli citizens, and how they treat uh, settlers. Now there is a new checkpoint, which is uh, not new, but it's a checkpoint which has been privatized only recently. And it is taken over by an Israeli uh, security company, private company. And they are so mean to any, everybody who is not a Jew. And we saw that. Uh, or anybody, anybody who says that they are coming from Ramallah and not from uh, a settlement, mm -hmm. they are very nasty. They put on the side. They have a, a body search. They search the, the, the car. So <coughs> some people told me, well, it's on the way to Tel Aviv. Some people told me that they prefer now to go through Kalandia and not to go through this checkpoint because of the humiliation and the time. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of things that you hear. Now, what do they think? They think that they, they, this they are... Uh, God-given right to be there, the settlers. Uh, they see themselves as people full of values. Uh, they were born there. I mean, f uh, it's already second and third generation, so they don't. They think that they have full right to remain where they are. They don't even think that that the same policy which says that okay, you've been there for so long, then it's your right to remain here. The same policy. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It just yeah. doesn't dawn into them. But they, when you, they, I mean, they really do think of themselves as, as salt of the earth. I mean, they're yes. the pioneers who... Uh, they are pioneers, and they are... Though, uh, it's not me, but somebody who told me who went to Givad, uh, to, to Male Adumim settlement, and was talking to a person, and she said, and she told her, frankly, we will never have such a house in Israel proper, oh, yes. or whatever term. So people are aware of it, that they have better chances to better housing, uh, in these areas. I joined once a group of journalists who was hosted by the uh, Settlers uh, Council. Uh, and they were very impressed. The journalists were terribly impressed by the settlements because, you know, it has when you go, especially to those uh, 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 semi-collective settlements, you get a sense of old, of old Israel, you know, community and, 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 and sense of um, solidarity, internal solidarity. It feels very, uh, for those romantics, it, it feels very nice. Mm. Nostalgic even. Nostalgic, yes. Yeah. It feels very uh, uh, like really the old, old days, uh, Israel of the old days. Mm. You have a question in the back and purple. Just, one, just wait for the mic. Hi, my name is Monica Dorhoy, and I just came from the gym. We don't yeah, hear just you. speak up a little. The yes, mic's not my very name strong, is Monica so. Dorhoy, and I just came from the gym, and I'm happy that you, you came know, from where? From the gym. Uh, <laughs> I just came. Welcome. <laughs> just a light. I didn't uh, have time today. I just made. I just <laughs> at a little bit of breakfast. Um, thank you for for your comments. Uh, I worked for seven years in the Middle East, and I worked for Palestinian Authority, but also for Netanyahu is a friend. Also for. 
for Israeli. I mean, Bibi Netanyahu is a friend, a personal friend of mine. But I worked in international development in the Palestinian for um, solid waste, different investments, I'm a banker. And what I noticed, and I think the new direction is very, very interesting, very subtle, have very long-term effects. Because of what happened in the Middle East, and I have a comment and a question, what happened in the Middle East, the revolution, Palestinians might lose the right to, sit or to statehood. Why? Watch in the future. Because there are so many countries in turmoil in the Middle East. Sorry, different. it's really hard to hear. It will be very difficult for the Palestinians to have a state. I think the international conventions, which is the pathway that right now the Israelis have managed to put, it's more to accept as a part of territory. Very, very interesting observation. Just five five years down Sorry, the line. It's, it's, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, a little bit. Just if, if because I lost my voice at the gym. Uh, so if you could just um, get right to the question. That would yes, be great and the question, the time. second question is, being an economist, my number one issue is inflation. And in the Middle East, because of the revolution, it's very hard to have a model that will capture it. What's the economic pathway of the GDP? Five years, three years down the line, we correct downwards. We know this from, the, from Eastern Europe. And we're not capturing any inflation. Do you see any issues, sure prices or fear? You're asking, about, you're asking about the Palestinian GDP? No, the inflation. You're Do you see a, a factor in the region? And what's your own take? Because you're doing your own research. It was very hard to understand your comments and questions. Because the qu the many words were just swollen, you know. I don't know swollen. if it's the yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, is, I think is inflation having an impact on the Palestinian economy? Um, you cannot relate to Palestinian economy as a normal economy, uh, uh, acting like American or uh, Israeli or British or I don't know. Israeli econo uh, Palestinian economy is captive in Israeli occupation policies. So any, <laughs> any such mainstream uh, uh, or, or, or uh, I don't know, Wall Street uh, assessment of the Palestinian economy is completely out of touch from reality. You have to ask how, uh, what are the uh, uh, um, obstacles put on Palestinian economy? And you'll find them. I mean, many, there are many Palestinian uh, obstacles that I could name. But the majority, the, 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 the main, the most important obstacles are put by Israeli policies. So, if, I mean, those policies, for example, being like the Israelis decide no, who just comes in, in what goes In 60% of your land, in 60% of your territory, you cannot develop. You cannot do anything. That the uh, products of the Gaza Strip cannot be uh, exported or cannot go out of, uh, of Gaza to the West Bank. That you don't have freedom of movement. I mean, just logical things that uh, I guess that economists of the 18th century would have understood it very clearly, that this is impossible to run an economy without these basics. But all these basics, Israel is uh, 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 controlling and uh, limiting. I think we have one more question. Yeah, back in, uh, sorry, there's a mic right there. Sorry, hi. Uh, my name's Hadar Harris, and I direct the Center for Human Rights and humanitarian law at American University uh, up, up the hill. Um, my question is, I, and I, I echo the thanks for the important work that both of you, all of you, do, um, but I was glad to hear you mention privatization and how privatization of security services, privatization of water and infrastructure, privatization of so many different aspects of core parts of life uh, not just in Israel, but also as it relates to um, the occupation, have an impact. I wonder um, if you could reflect a little bit on that and also about, you know, I look at it from a legal point of view in terms of accountability and the ability to actually influence through the legal system on private actors as they take over these quasi-governmental roles and how that might open a new dimension of the ability to advocate for accountability where there is, you know, overt discrimination, where there is um, uh, where there are clear human rights violations going on. 
So when you talk about privatization, you mean, for example, the privatization of security at the, at the checkpoints, checkpoints right. right? Which is actually a very important right. issue. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, and people miss. You know, people say, "Oh, in the good times when the army was there, it was much easier." Yeah. <laughs> at yes. least they spoke English <laughs> or Russian. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Look, I, I think, of course, this privatization is, uh, 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 you see it especially at the checkpoints and uh, the whole system of checkpoints. And uh, the, 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 the word checkpoint is tricky because it's as if it's only for checking, but it's uh, uh, actu actually for blocking. It's for filtering. And anybody who does not have a permit, or it is not a checkpoint for Israelis because Israelis can cross any without a problem on both directions. I think when it suits, uh, it is a governmental or an official uh, project. When it, suit, it suits them, it becomes, a private, it becomes privatized. It's not that the privatization is the cause of uh, deterioration. Because the whole system is, 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 uh, is coming from, 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 from the head, from the government. So it's a policy. It's not, uh, it's not because it is privatized. Yeah, so they have uh, contractors sometimes who demolish the, 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 the tents. They, they, they bring contractors. They are not, uh, be, they are not working. Uh, they are not uh, in the, in the pay, um, payroll of the civil administration. Uh, but this is, uh, I don't see it as, a, as a, such a major issue in, our, in this reality of occupation. Uh, you have tenders which are uh, issued, of course, by the Ministry of uh, Housing. Yeah. Uh, but there and it comes there from the top, yeah. But there was an issue recently, I think just last week, with uh, s uh, some European organizations wanting to boycott uh, Israeli architects because they participate in these tenders for building oh, yeah. houses in the West Bank. Yeah. So there okay. is some influence of this. Sure. And there was an, and I don't know if this was uh, uh, there was a retraction of this, but there was a certain uh, batch of, of tenders that the Israeli Ministry of uh, Housing uh, issued, and there was a big uproar about it. It was in between Kerry's uh, visits. And uh, one of the conditions of these tenders was that architects, Israeli architects, whenever they have to accept a project, in, in the, when they get a project, uh, when they win and they get the project to build or to, to plan inside Israel, they also have to accept the project in the West Bank, uh -huh. in the settlements, mm -hmm. which means to oblige them to plan in settlements. I still, I indeed didn't check if it's, uh, uh, I mean, I tried and I didn't get the answer uh, if this was canceled or not, if this was revoked or not. But the intention is clear. The intention is to involve as many p people as possible in the whole uh, settlement process. So basically, you can't really separate between Israel proper and and, and occupied and the occupied territories when it comes to the economy. No. Yes, it is it's impossible. impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, you know, like I, I get my salary at Bank Hapoalim, mm -hmm. the Hapoalim Bank, and it has so many branches in the West Bank. Right. So who knows how many wh what they do with my. Uh, Right. My money also for there. So it's, uh, it's impossible. Right. Um, I think there was one more question up here towards the front. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you have one more? We just have, actually, we have actually two minutes and 30 seconds. So very one statement, one, one line question. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I appreciate very much uh, uh, the clarity of your presentations, uh, Amira. Uh, I'm hard of hearing, and I'm, uh, I was able to hear every word that you spoke. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, some of my education comes from the uh, uh, film um, Five Broken Cameras that I suspect many people here have seen. And I gained the impression there that the Israeli army, partly because it delayed so long in moving the fence when the Supreme Court said the fence should be moved, that, that I get the impression that the uh, Israeli army is pretty much a law unto itself in the West Bank. That it's, uh, well, something of a dictatorship, if you will. And I wonder if you can comment about the culture of the leadership and the, uh, and the soldiers of the uh, Israeli Defense Force in the occupation zone. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really important question, actually. <coughs> the Israeli soldiers are educated to understand that their first role is to protect the life of Israeli citizens. 
wherever they are. So their supreme role in the West Bank is to protect the settlements. This I heard with my own ears in one of the briefings that uh, the, then, then he was not, but the, today's uh, um, um, Ramatkal, uh, uh, chief, chief of staff, staff chief. Benny Gantz, when he was only a com local commander in the West Bank, and uh, uh, I remember very well, it was immediately after the withdrawal from, the, from Lebanon, a few months before the Second Intifada, he called for some uh, journalists to come for a briefing. And he said, you have to know that I had an urgent meeting with the rabbis of the West Bank to piece their, to piece their mind that there is not going to be a withdrawal as there was in, the, in, the Jordan, in, in Lebanon, from Lebanon. And he, said, we, and he said it, we consider the role of every soldier is to protect the life of, of Israeli citizens here. And that means that anybody approaching a settlement uh, is seen as, susp as a suspect. And I asked him, if, if you have a demonstration of 50, 60,000 Palestinians unarmed walking toward the settlement and demanding uh, equal uh, distribution of water, will you also shoot? He didn't answer. But you feel that when you see, when you go to, to areas of friction with settlers, and this is something that we didn't talk about, you see it very well with the, how the, the soldiers know that they cannot interfere and stop settlers from attacking Palestinians. On the contrary, they help them. Uh, in many, in many, it's one of the, the, the when I cited all the, the, the changes in the recent, that we've noticed, there is an increase in settlers' violence, mm -hmm. but it is not individual violence. Organized. It is, yeah, it is come together, it is a, in a, a, a part of a program to indeed to deter Palestinians from reaching their land. And uh, 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 the army, in order to prevent friction, what they do, they prevent Palestinians from reaching their land. So uh, when you talk, that, that's, that's what the soldiers know. They have to defend the rights, to protect the rights of the, of the settlers. And for them, every Palestinian is a terrorist uh, in potential, or terrorist until proven otherwise. And sometimes this can be proven only after the Palestinian is dead. That's something you hear uh, for me too, from any ordinary soldier. Soldier, he knows that his instructions are to protect the Jewish settlers. Okay. Yeah. But there's uh, there was one specific aspect of this question that, that I'll I'll close with. And I wanted to ask you about. There was uh, there's a sort of a breakdown between the Supreme Court of Israel's authority and and the army. So for, ex for very specifically in Berlin, the court ruled in 2007 that the root of the fence that divided the village had to be moved, and it took four years for the army to carry out that. Yeah, and also in other places, yes, they say that they need time, they need resources. This I see as something which is, yeah, they don't abide immediately by the, the, the ruling, but then they find other tricks to, to, to abide by a ruling, as they did in uh, Road 443, right. that uh, is an apartheid road. It is road only for Jews, uh, or only for Israelis, but it was built to, to attend to the needs of the Jews on Palestinian land. And then there was a lawsuit and a petition against it. And then the army came with a genius uh, solution that Palestinians could drive, there, could, could drive there, but only in a circle. So you don't reach anywhere. You can drive in a circle, like in the Luna Park. <laughs> so, uh, so this was the genius solution of the, of the army that the the high court accepted. Okay. And now you don't see any Palestinian car over there. So, um, you know, they can come with pretexts why they are late in abiding by something. But again, I have to say that high court does never approach the, the, those petitions uh, in their principled level. They always re t address it as an individual case. They don't connect all the dots and make and 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 make the picture they refuse to do so when it comes to demolitions when it comes to to uh, 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 water policy they do not say oh there is this basic systemic discrimination of Palest against palestinians so there is something unlawful here no they always demand to treat case by case 
that's why for me it is not uh, uh, okay. So once the issue, the, it was a lot of hoo ha around Belaim, and and uh, uh, happily so. And indeed, in some in, in some aspects, Belaim is better off than others because, for example, they can cross the, the fence, they can cross the the the, the um, uh, uh, the, the gates of the fence any time and reach their land, while other villages who were separated from their land by the separation wall cannot do it any time. They need to wait for soldiers, and soldiers don't come on time. And they do it once a week or twice a week. So this is the least of the problems, the time and it took them to abide by the ruling. I think it's much more the tricks that they are using all the time. And the fact that the high court refuses to, to address these issues as a systemic system. problem. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. um, we're going to have to end. We're just a few minutes over, which I consider a miracle. Um, thank you all for being such an attentive and engaged audience and for coming this morning. I appreciate it very much. Thank you.